It is my great pleasure to introduce Brian Robertson from UC Santa Cruz. Um, in this introduction, the most important thing I'm going to say, of course, the first thing, which is that Brian did his PhD right here at Harvard, as Laura's, um, and then he got tons of fancy fellowships to go to Chicago and Caltech, uh, and then ended up being a professor at Arizona and now at Santa Cruz. But what I think really stands out about Brian's uh, research is just the mind-boggling variety of topics that he's worked on. So it all started with what we now would call sort of classical galaxy formation, you know, disks and mergers. And then he went to things like dark matter annihilation, scaling relations, onto hydrodynamics, turbulence, and eventually Hubble ultra deep fields and what they can tell us about cosmic reionization. Just when we thought we might have lost him to the observers, oh, God. Um, you know, you. here he is. <laughs> Telling us, guess what, about something totally new, which is galactic winds and what we can learn about them from these extremely, truly massive simulations on GPUs. Please. All right, thanks. That was uh, much too nice. It's great to be back, of course, and there are people here that I wasn't expecting to see, so it's great uh, to see you, everyone, as well. Thanks for having me. Today I'm going to tell you about uh, some simulations that... Uh, primarily, Evan Schneider, my former student, uh, she was at Arizona, now she's a full fellow at Princeton. She's been doing with this new uh, code that she developed called Choya. Uh, I'll tell you all about Choya, but the thing about Choya that you should keep in mind is that it runs on GPUs, and this allows you to do very, very large simulations provided you have a lot of GPUs. Not unlike having a lot of cores on a computer, but the techniques that we use when using the GPUs uh, allow for us to scale to very, very large simulations that are very good for specific purposes, and one specific purpose that it's good for is looking for uh, looking at galactic outflows in a lot of detail, which is what I'm going to tell you about today scientifically. And then um, this is work that Todd Thompson's also had some hand in, so I wanted to acknowledge uh, him as well. So this is a picture of uh, M82. I think everyone has seen this picture, but in a lot of ways it summarizes many of the important roles that uh, galactic winds play in, in galaxy formation in general. So we know that low mass galaxies don't have the cosmic bar baryon fraction. And so those galaxies must somehow get rid of uh, a good deal of baryonic mass. And we think that this happens through some combination of effects, one of which, you know, an important one, is galactic scale outflows actually expelling material from the centers of galaxies. And these outflows are multi-phase. Okay, so here I'm showing you a picture of the disk. The green and yellow is VVI optical imaging. Uh, the purple-blue is soft x-rays. Hard x-rays are way out here in kind of this uh, magenta color. And then in red, we have H-alpha, which is cool material. So in these outflows, you know, you're driving out a hot wind, but in the context of this hot wind, there's more than one phase. It's not just all hot. Some of it is quite cool, and here it's uh, emitting recombination radiation in H alpha. Okay, so we can observe these outflows in spatially resolved X-ray emitting gas, as well as cooler optical line emission. This is line emission. I'll tell you about line absorption in just a moment. Okay, so for us to understand the way in which these galaxies get rid of the material inside of them, we need to understand how to account for the total mass. So you have to account for the multiple phases. You have to be sensitive to the multiple phases. And then you have to learn something about how those phases came to be. So the question is not just how much stuff can you throw out of the galaxy, but what are the physics associated with setting the properties of that outflow? And what does that tell you about the feedback processes inside of the galaxy, as well as the cooling and the structure of the gas in the outflow itself? So these are the things that we're interested in thinking about in the context of, uh, of this work, and it's still very much a work in progress. So, Brian? Yes, sir. Just to set the stage, there are two types of outflows that one can imagine. You do star formation, you do black hole activity mm -hmm. in the center, and the, the, the multi-phase structure may depend on, on the nature of the, yeah, at, of the source. So are you restricting your attention just to star formation? Yeah, so uh, the models that I will show you are very simplified. And there is one model that is not unlike what you might imagine in an AGN-driven outflow. Uh, however, the time scale of the energy input may not be the same as the time scale that an AGN might input. So 
some of the structure of the outflow that I'll show you may be appropriate for modeling a nuclear um, engine, uh, but the time scale over which that it acts may not be appropriate, so that's something we can, we can talk some about. Okay, so, uh, so then you might say, well, this is just a local thing, you're just looking at local starbursts. How do you know that these outflows are important over long periods of cosmic history? What is it that makes us think that outflows from galaxies, these galactic winds, are prevalent at times uh, when the majority, let's say, of the stars were forming uh, in a global uh, sense. And here we're looking at magnesium absorption and then over here some other uh, cool line absorption in galaxies at redshift of one, two, and two to three. This is work by Bordeloy et al. Ben Wiener from uh, the Deep Survey and the Chuck Seidel's group. And what you can see uh, in the magnesium-2 doublet that there's absorption in magnesium-2. These are down the barrel observations. Basically, you're looking, taking the spectrum of the galaxy itself. Okay. And you can see the velocity here. There's absorption in the first line of the doublet out to about 1,000 kilometers a second blue shifted from the galaxy. Okay. So this is relatively cold material, and it's moving quite fast. It's moving at 1,000 kilometers a second. So I showed you in the previous picture hot gas, and you know I think we can all imagine making hot gas outflow at a large rate is not too hard because the sound speed of that gas is quite high. This material, however, is much colder. Okay, we're talking of tens, uh, 10 to the 4, a few times 10 to the 4 Kelvin gas. So the sound speed of that material is much, much less. So this is supersonic outflowing. Material. How do you organize the outflow? How do you give rise to material that shows up in absorption that shows the range of velocities that are apparent in these observations? Okay, so that's a physical question. Now, I think we, we're all on the same page that, yeah, these outflows occur, but then, you know, what about this information can we use to learn something about the physics of the outflow that actually occurs in galaxies? And it occurs over a wide range. Of redshift. These are mostly star forming galaxies, but if you split by star formation, say high, middle, or low star formation rate objects, those objects have similar absorption profiles, so it's not just the star formation rate that's doing it. And then, of course, if you go by stellar mass, these things, stellar mass and star formation, are correlated through what some people call the main sequence of galaxy formation, star forming galaxies. It's not such a surprise that both of them have a correlation of one mass. Okay. And then you can see, uh, just to mention it in uh, Chuck et al's work, of course you still have this absorption out to 1,000 kilometers a second. The green line here is lime alpha in emission, um, but the different lines have different covering factors uh, in this outflowing gas. Okay, so that gives you some sense that if you look at different ionization species, and this is something that we're still working on, you should see different covering factors and different absorption profiles in those different species. Okay, so there's multi-phase structure even in the cold phase, and that's something that's worth uh, understanding because there's observational connections that can be made. Now, you might say, well, that's well and good. You're just looking down the barrel at galaxies. How do you know that this stuff is actually present around galaxies and out to what radio? Okay, so in the local universe, we can use the cost spectrograph to look in the UV at these lines and at high redshift, they're redshifted where we can see them, optical spectroscopy. These are um, not down the barrel observations, these are offset observations as a function of projected radius. And you can see in cost halos, there's silicon 2 absorption. That absorption declines, and there's some question about whether these are just upper limits or actually you have detections beyond the virial radius. Uh, here, these are quiescent versus star forming galaxies. Both of them seem to have some absorption at least out to half the virial radius in the quiescent galaxies, but maybe further, and people are still working on this as well. So we know that this cool gas actually can leave the galaxy. It looks like it can leave the galaxy. So, you know, it's not just about recycling that material. Some of this material may fall back. All right? We don't know the velocity of this material. We just know it's equivalent with the velocity relative to the galaxy. I mean. 
so some of it may turn around and come back, but some of it may leave the galaxy as well, and so it may be expelled. It could be that as the galaxy grows over time, these are relatively close by objects, but you know, imagine this process earlier in the universe, then they could, maybe as the virial radius of the object grows, some of that stuff is captured back and falls back in. We don't, we don't know that. But we would like to be able to understand how this cool material gets as far out as it does. So where does it originate? Does it originate from the center of the galaxy? Is it something where you've taken cold material and somehow thrown it out of the galaxy? Is it forming along the way? Are you cooling material out? That's a possibility. Um, we need to think about this in some detail. And of course, you know, people have before, and I'll say something about that. So, you know, we know that this material is out there, and what, what I was hinting at, I guess, is that we know that this cold gas is hard to accelerate. So you might say, well, I'll take some cold gas, and I know I have this hot wind, so I'll act on this cold material with the hot wind. So. This is a, a long-standing problem that people have been simulating from some time. You know, uh, Klein et al. originally in, in two dimensions, the cloud crushing problem, but the simulations got more and more sophisticated over time. This is uh, our attempt at it. Here you have a turbulent cloud. So I took a turbulent simulation. I excised a sphere out of that simulation that has a broad density distribution. This is not a homogeneous cloud. This is a cloud that has a large range of internal densities. And then I put it in a hot wind. So the hot wind is moving in this direction. I haven't put it in a hot wind. Uh, and we allow for the gas to radiatively cool as well. Okay. So you'll see what happens uh, as the cloud gets, this is a three-dimensional simulation, as the cloud encounters this cold wind, it is shredded into pieces. The shredding happens primarily through uh, shearing instabilities at the surface of these clouds. It's uh, more complicated than that, perhaps, because this uh, three-dimensional structure is uh, quite complex. So there are regions, denser regions, in, that are kind of like cloudlets. So as the low-density material is quickly evacuated by the hot gas, then you expose more surface area to the hot wind. Um, you, know, you might wonder, well, how small can these clouds get? And there's uh, uh, McCourt and uh, Elliot Quarter had said, well, you know, basically the smallest that they get is when the sound speed times uh, the cooling time, that product is about as small as they get. And you might say, well, can this material reform? If I throw it out here, can it cool off again if I wait long enough? And some people at Gronk and O have said, well, you know, maybe kind of intermediate uh, temperature gas if its density is high enough, even though it's torn off in the main cloud, maybe it can reform some cold material behind. Okay, and that might uh, be in training. This is happening on very small scales, a very high resolution simulation. Um, you know, this is 2048 or something, and its cross section is 1024 by 1024, or 768 by 768. Um, the resolution of the simulation is about the size of the Oort cloud, to give you some perspective on that. And uh, the simulation uh, that we've run here has the same resolution everywhere. So it is a static mesh uh, grid simulation. So we're not using refinement to try to tell us about you know, the dense structures versus the hot structure. You may wonder, why is that important? Well, in this case, there's a variety of uh, density structures <coughs> over a wide range of temperatures. And if you're interested in cooling, then you know that the typical cooling times depend on density squared. And perturbations in intermediate temperature gas can lead to cooling more rapidly and more efficiently than um, if you ignore that low density hot temperature gas because you're interested in the densest parts, which is typically what refinement does. Okay, so that's one reason why you might use this kind of code that I'll go into some more details about later. Wait, sorry, Brent. So you kind of left us hanging here. Like, what happens if you keep running this thing too hard? <laughs> Uh, so, so the thing to, to pull away from this, sorry, I, I may have just gotten sidetracked, um, is that this cold material is not moving very fast relative to the hot wind. Okay. So the hot wind here has a thousand kilometers a second. You can see how fast the hot wind is moving kind of in the background here, but this cold stuff is not moving that fast. It gets up only to 100 or 200 kilometers a second. Okay. So the, the point of this simulation was that at least at the resolution that we're probing here, which does not necessarily go all the way down to the shattering scale that other people 
looked at uh, Marty Spar in Boulder's River. I don't know if they're here or not, but um, yeah, so the, the cold material is only moving a few hundred kilometers a second. This kind of process, taking this cold material and trying to accelerate it to the velocity of the wind, is not a process that these simulations suggest is very efficient. Whether this happens on a very, very small scale, so you kind of get like a fog of cold <coughs> material that is moving along with the hot phase, I think is still uh, up for debate. I think it's also still up for debate whether you can reform uh, cold material from uh, kind of intermediate temperature material that's torn off of the cloud, like Gronkinova suggested. The reason why I, I'm not sure about this is that, you know, real clouds are more like this rather than what they simulated, which are turbulent clouds. So they have a wide range of existing initial densities. And so whether the amount of mass that's available to be torn off and reformed in these different phases, it's not clear to me that that, uh, that process will work uh, as they describe it. Uh, right. Yeah. Once you say real cloud, real clouds have got magnetic fields, uh -huh. which will yes. tie the whole yeah. cloud together. Right, right. But then, you know, how strong does the magnetic field have to be, and what is the orientation? Is it tangled? And yeah, uh, Mike McCord has said something about this too. Um, you know, I think the question's out about what the right physics are. You know, I'm, not, I'm not making a very strong claim, I think, um, in this simulation. And that's something that Evan is interested in pursuing. So, you know, I, I said, well, you know, this material is hard to accelerate, yet it exists. We're going back to where we started from for a little bit. Uh, the main reason why I want to show this slide is just to demonstrate that M82 is not the only such galaxy out there. There are at least three uh, <laughs> galaxies where you can make pictures that are like this, uh, where you have hot X-ray gas uh, combined with cold H alpha here, you have N2 even. Uh, so that's interesting, and actually, Tim Heckman and I and uh, some collaborators, Evan, uh, we have a, a HST program to get some more narrowband imaging of M82 and other narrowband uh, features that probe some of the other emission lines that we might see. So we'll have uh, hopefully some better data coming soon if you're on the tap and you believe that that's a good thing to do. So, so I, you know, I, I'm suggesting, well, maybe let's put aside for the moment what happens on extremely small scales what happens on the scales that you're seeing in these pictures? Okay. Can we use hydro simulations to address those? And that, that's actually very, to do it in the way that I'll describe, is challenging because it requires a large computational effort. And the reason is that if we want to simulate in detail this multi-phase structure, we need to be sure that we're capturing, at least to uh, some finite resolution, the density perturbations uh, that exist in both the hot and the cold phases. So we don't want to just concentrate on the cold phase. We also want to capture the, the fast-moving, low-density gas. Okay? And that is an expensive proposition to do. So, uh, so you might say, well, you know, it's so expensive, how are you going to do it? And the way that we've taken it is uh, using new architectures, the GPU. So here I'm being a little bit unfair, but this gives you the general picture. This is how you might envision a, uh, a grid code working on a CPU. So you have different grid elements. You've tiled your simulation volume with, uh, with cubes. And then you say, well, I want to update the properties of every single grid cell. You go from cell to cell. You bring in the conserved variables that you care about. You calculate some fluxes with the neighboring cells. And then you loop, do a loop, and you update the properties of those cells. Of course. Modern CPUs are multi-core and they're multi-threaded, and so maybe you're not, and they can use vector operations, so maybe you're not doing one or two, maybe you're doing 16 cells at a time uh, per thread. That's possible, uh, depending on uh, the CPU you're using, your, your compiler, this kind of thing. But with a GPU, it looks more like this process, where you know it's a bit Harlequin and Disco, um, but, you're, you, you advance the properties of many cells at one scene. So GPUs are interesting computationally because, and I'll change this so no one gets sick, they're, they're interesting computationally because they operate on many threads at once, thousands of threads potentially. Okay, so you can, if you can supply the GPU with information quickly enough and keep it busy, then you might be able to leverage this computational power to do uh, you know, grid-based calculations much more efficiently than, um, than otherwise. And, and this bears out, although the, you know, the speed up is 
uh, limited, it depends on the problem. For some test cases, we get speedups of 75 times uh, existing codes. Uh, for other problems, it's only a few times. Uh, better kind of computational element, CPU versus GPU. So is this called, yeah. called GPUs or it's an hybrid? No, called GPUs. I'll explain, I'll describe it in detail now. Thank you. Okay, so it's called Choya, computational hydrodynamics on parallel, that's the parallel sign, architectures. Uh, it is GPU native, so that means that it all basically all of the important calculations run on the GPU, except for uh, things like communication and other serial processes that I'll tell you about in a moment. Uh, it's also publicly available, so you can go and download it yourself. If you have a GPU you'd like to try it out on, uh, feel free to download it and, and try it. It's there for you. Uh, it incorporates all of the state-of-the-art algorithms, which some of them are not that state-of-the-art. It's just mostly what people have used. Uh, it works with unsplit integrators, so we update all of the directionality at the same time. We compute the fluxes in all directions at the same time. Um, it uses precise Riemann solvers. We have different integrators, so sometimes we use quarter transport, sometimes we, we don't. Uh, it has dual energy, so it can handle um, you know, very high Mach numbers. And uh, it also includes some interesting GPU accelerator radiated cooling. I won't go into too much detail from this, uh, but it turns out that GPUs, because they were built to play video games, have special hardware in them, okay? And uh, they're called texture memory. At least this, up until now, has been the case that things are changing a little bit. Texture memory is interesting because uh, if you put something in texture memory, you can actually do interpolation in hardware. So if you have a 2D table and you want the 1.75 you know, index element, it actually does that interpolation, interpolating between the neighboring cells in memory. And that's very fast, so if you have some tabulated lookup for you know, cooling or for IMFs in the input from supernova or from a variety of other tabular information that many people use in simulations. Uh, that's a great way of doing it if you're, uh, if you're interested. And some of the details are in these two papers, uh, which you can find on in the abstract. So how does it work? So this was a question I was asking. You have some initialization, some initial conditions. You calculate the first time step, how long it is. You apply some boundary conditions. You know, it's a massively parallel code, which I'll describe a bit of that. The MPI communications are done on the CPU, so the CPUs communicate with one another. If there's some output, they handle the I.O. But then, for the time step, if you want to do the hydrodynamics, all of that is pushed off onto the GPU. So we do the Riemann solution. Uh, uh, for instance, you might do a half-step update, do an interface reconstruction of the fluid at the interface at the half time step, use that to calculate a new Riemann solution, then update your conserved variables, your mass, your total energy, your momenta, and then you calculate the next time step on the GPU, and then you repeat. So okay. one GPU per CPU? Yes, uh, it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah, it doesn't have to be that way. But part of the problem is this step. This, this boundary here is a boundary that involves a lot of communication on the motherboard, because you have stuff that's on the CPU and has to get to the GPU. And depending on what that communication channel is, that is the limiting step in, in some way. So uh, we're not completely bandwidth limited on the GPU, but uh, some of these new uh, architectures, which I'll tell you about in just a moment, are better because they have higher bandwidth than, say, PCIe. Okay. Uh, so that's an important point. So in order for this to work well, though, you have to keep the GPUs busy. So the GPUs can do a lot. But they can only do a lot, they're only effective because of this bandwidth with issue if the number of floating point operations per memory access is very, very large. Okay, so as long as you can get the stuff onto the GPU, it can do a lot with it. But you don't want to be touching random places in memory. So this is why a static mesh grid code is actually well designed to run on the GPU, because all of the threads can be made contiguous in memory. You can coalesce the memory to a big long array. And you know that one given thread you know, you can give it access to some of this other information in, in quick ways without having to hit the, the global GPU memory too often. Okay. Those are all tricks that you, you should play if you want to use GPUs to their full advantage because the architecture is there and um, in order to get at this, we have to use CUDA kernels. Okay, so if you, if you run on a GPU, I know this is a technical part of the discussion which is screwed off someone. Uh, I, will, I will move past this pretty soon. 
if you want, you know, if you want to use the uh, the GPU and you want to get access to all the GPU has to offer, using CUDA on NVIDIA GPU is a good option right now. And the reason is that you actually have hardware, um, you know, APIs that you can deal with the actual, you know, structure on the GPU itself in memory. Uh, if you use things like OpenCL, that isn't quite good yet. Okay, and so you will get something more efficient using CUDA correctly. All right, and so you know. Uh, why is this a good thing? Well, it turns out that some of the largest computers in the world, the vast majority of their computational power is in GPUs. So Titan and Oak Ridge used to be the number one computer in the world, now it's like seven or eight. Okay, and this is a system that is 20 petaflops, but the vast majority of the power is in the GPUs. There are you know, as many GPUs here as uh, nodes. Okay, so there's 18,000 something GPUs. Uh, and if you don't use the GPUs, you're throwing away, you know, 18 petaflops of power there. When we first applied for time on Titan, they said, well, you're not using the CPUs, so we're not going to give you time on the computer, which I, I was a bit surprised at, but then when they realized what that was saying, they later gave us time. Uh, and they've replaced uh, the replacement. Uh, Titan still exists, I mean, we're still using it. Uh, Summit, Summit has not gone through user acceptance testing yet, so it's still, uh, they haven't fully bought it, but it is currently the, the fastest supercomputer in the world. And it uses a new uh, GPU version uh, called V100s, which are faster and have much more memory. And also it has a different uh, node structure. It has many GPUs, six GPUs per node. Okay, there are only two CPUs, uh, two socket nodes. Um, and the bandwidth is now what's called NVLink2, which is substantially faster than PCIe, and there's a direct NV2 link, uh, NV2 link between each CPU and the GPUs. And that's important, because if you share a PCIe bus, then you, know, you cut your bandwidth uh, in half or by the number of GPUs that are sharing it. And that's bad. That's a bottleneck. And this system does not have that bottleneck. So uh, our code runs very fast on Summit, Brian, just yes. a quick question. So, so the reason that GPUs are so useful is that there is a huge market of video games, right? Uh, and Bitcoin. But is it, yes. is it related <laughs> Seriously. To, yes. Is it the technology that allows GPUs to be more efficient or just the market that drove this technology? So I, I think that that's a, that's a good question. Um, I think that it's mostly market-based. Uh, and these kinds of GPUs are not, they're not so much driven by um, uh, the gaming market because the gaming market, actually, the GPUs are floating point accuracy. They actually disable the double precision accuracy on those GPUs because they don't need them for the gaming. Uh, but things like oil and gas and now um, the, you know, cryptocurrencies. Actually, if you ask someone how much a GPU computer costs last year, it was really a lot. <laughs> now it's a little bit less because the market's come down some. Um, but at, you know, I would say we need to leverage this investment, which is enormous in that market. For science, that's what I'm trying to do, and this is not the end stage. You know, there are things that can be improved here for sure. Um, this is one application that is pushing in that direction. I've tried to get them interested in the science, which I think they are becoming increasingly interested in how they would apply these GPUs to scientific calculations in astrophysics. Right. All right. Yes. Right. About your, your code architecture, are you are you shipping? Are you storing the part the part the cell information in in the main memory and then sending it off to the GPU for every time step? Or, yes. Or do you send it off, do a bunch of cycles and then send it back? No, we don't. You know, we do it, yes. We send it back every single time. And that's because, yeah, so that's another issue. So we have to have uh, communication between each MPI rank, right? So we have to actually share go cells between our sub-volumes, and that has to happen every single time step. Now, there are ways of doing this GPU to GPU, uh, there's a different protocol than MPI, which is what we use for communication, that allows you to communicate between the GPUs, uh, but you'll still, in principle, be limited by the network bandwidth between different nodes, because we have thousands, oh, let me just show you. We can use, we've used 16,000 GPUs at once to do calculations before, and that doesn't fit in a single node. So eventually you'll, you'll be limited uh, by the bandwidth of the, the network, so it doesn't matter too much whether you incur some additional costs, but it doesn't matter too much, I think. Um, there are, are other codes that actually work faster than our code uh, that work on GPUs, and it's because they don't do this intermediate step. They do a bunch of updates, and they only output the data 
at one time, but they're not parallelized like this is. Okay, so strong scaling, weak scaling is the normal test you would say. So if you take one problem, you split it into small pieces. How does that scale as you split it into smaller and smaller pieces across more and more GPUs? The, uh, the strong scaling is very good. The communications are bad because the surface to volume ratio increases as you split uh, a large problem into many, many smaller problems. But usually we don't do that. Usually we're interested in weak scaling tests. And there, our performance is very, very good. So we can run on the largest supercomputers in the world with as many GPUs, more or less the same as when we use two of them uh, in terms of efficiency, very small efficiency loss. OK. And it also performs well. So this is uh, a fun simulation that people um, may be interested in. This is a classic implosion test. There's this great old paper by Liska and Windroff where they have a lot of uh, example uh, test calculations you may be interested in and compare a bunch of different techniques that were around at the time. Those techniques have not changed dramatically uh, over the intervening uh, time period. And basically, there's a low density, lo uh, low pressure region surrounded by a high pressure region. Okay, and then you just press play. We're going to look at a quadrant and see what happens. And this is uh, what it does. And, and the point of this calculation, which I won't belabor too much longer since I've gotten to the science, is that uh, the code is actually axisymmetric. Okay. It's uh, symmetric about y equals x. Okay, so these cells are exactly the same as the cells on the other side to machine precision over 56 billion cell updates over the whole simulation time. And so why is that important? Well, there, there, are pheno there is phenomenology that only appears, or that it's the character of that phenomenology is influenced by whether or not the problem is symmetric. This is one simple example, but there are other potential examples. I think that this applicability is somewhat diminished in the real world, quote unquote real world, where things aren't perfectly symmetrical. Um, but it is the case that you know, there, are some, um, there are some problems that work well when you, have, when, when you can impose the symmetry. And if you want to know how fast this was working, it's 40 million cell updates per second on a single GPU. So that's a lot. OK, so now I'm going to tell you about simulations of galactic disks. These are isolated disks. Okay, using this code. And uh, the idea is that we're going to simulate something that's like M82. We're going to use a restricted volume, so we're not going to be able to, to simulate out to the virial radius. But we're going to be able to simulate this with a lot of resolution. So here you can see our, our box. We have the disk of M82. We're going to, you know, three scale lengths of M82 is 2.4 kiloparsecs. We have 10 kiloparsecs on the side here and right here. Uh, and then we're going to, going to have a 20 kiloparsec long volume there. Uh, the highest resolution simulations I'll show you are 4096 by 2048 by 2048. That's 17 or 18 billion cells. Uh, fixed resolution. So we have five, in the highest resolution, five, the 4.6 parsec resolution everywhere across this 10 by 10 by 20 kiloparsec simulation. And then we're going to ask ourselves what happens when we put uh, energy and momentum at the very center of this galaxy in different ways, and then drive an outflow, and what is the character of that outflow? And can we understand it, um, you know, simply? So these are very, uh, there are a lot of limitations of these calculations. We don't have a cosmological environment. Right? That's a really important thing. So I'm not simulating the CGM. That is not what I'm simulating. I'm simulating outflow. That's an important thing to note. Uh, the feedback prescription is, is very simple, but it's simple for a reason, which I'll describe uh, in a minute. We can actually, there are analytical models that describe um, at least one of these outflows that we can check against. Uh, and, you know, there, there are, um, you, you know, we have limited resolution, you would say, uh, over a limited volume, uh, but very good resolution. Okay, limited, but very good. All right. So, what are we trying to do? So, we have an isothermal disk, it's in vertical hydrostatic in rotation equilibrium. There's a static potential that models the stellar disk. There are no stars, so that's one limitation. There's a dark matter halo potential, no dark matter. That's another limitation. Uh, the mass and stars and the mass and dark matter follow these numbers within the volume. All simulations are run at uh, three resolutions, 5, 10, and 20 parsec in 10 by 10 by 20 kiloparsec volumes. And the, the allocation that we received through insights is 100 million core hours. It sounds like a lot. Um, it turns out that because of the way they count core hours, they count 30 core hours per node hour. Uh, so really, this is like a 3 million core hour allocation, or node hour allocation. And, and the largest, most expensive simulations we've done take a few hundred, two or 300 node hours. Okay, So that gives you some view. Uh, 
uh, we could get larger allocations. They happen. I'm going to tell you about two different ways that we have input the, the feedback. One is in a central, okay, so we're putting a certain amount of energy and momentum into the central region of this, uh, you know, within a, a certain radius. And then a cluster where we take that same energy and momentum input and then we distribute it in eight separate regions within the disk. Okay. These are, are, we're slowly progressing toward a more complete model of the star formation feedback. This is very prescribed and not general. Okay. But these are test calculations to get some feeling. We also uh, try to make good use of our simulations. So while the simulations are running, we vary the mass and energy loading. So if I describe the mass in the wind at the center, I'm talking about the mass in the center re region of the wind, that's some number beta times the star formation rate. And we're taking the star formation rate, uh, you know, we can put that by hand. Uh, and then the energy in the wind is some number times some parameter uh, scaled with the star formation rate. Okay. And uh, we have two modes. We have a high mass loading where uh, beta is 0.6. This is higher than what you observe in an M82. And then we have a low mass loading state, which we're just putting less energy in. This is actually appropriate for M82. This is uh, not dissimilar from M82. And then we see what happens. So we turn off the clock, we turn on the feedback, lower the feedback, and then we see, you can see what, how the structure and the output changes. And it does change. Okay, so I'm going to show you the first uh, simulations here. These are adiabatic simulations. There's no uh, cooling in these. And these are a central feedback model. So within this center, center region of 250 parsecs, we're putting in energy and momentum in the way that I just described. You shouldn't think about this so much as an explosion as, uh, as a blow dryer. That's a three-dimensional blow dryer, where you're con consistently pumping in energy and momentum. Okay. And that's important to generate a steady state, which this does. So, uh, the simulation, the feedback turns on after five million years. You'll see it start. This is temperature and this is density. The density, unfortunately, is not coming through as well on this projector. That's okay. You can see the very hot region and the structure, you know, this, this kind of uh, uh, dual shock structure. It's very familiar. People have done calculations of shocks before. Um, and then eventually, you know, if we wait long enough, there's some turbulence that's driven through kind of the interactions of nodes in the disk. Uh, so there's some structure that uh, is generated in the hot mode uh, through uh, interactions with the disk. Okay, this is not, of course, what I want to get to. Eventually, this is just setting the baseline for understanding how changing the physics step by step step changes the physical picture. This is just a summary of the same thing. Okay, so you see the forward and reverse shock initially as it's propagating out into this low density hydrostatic um, environment that we've set up. Uh, with the gas. Eventually that's completely removed, so it only takes about 10 million years for the wind to propagate across the volume, so at that stage uh, it's, uh, this wind completely replaces anything that's uh, in the exterior. Uh, and then you can see it becomes more collimated as more and more of the material is driven off uh, the disk. Now you might say, well, what does this tell you? Well, there's actually an analytical model that should describe this picture well, and that's this model by Shivani played from the 80s. And they assumed, so they wanted to model outflows in M82, and they assumed that there's a spherical symmetry and that the input is governed by the mass input rate, the energy input rate, and the size of the region that you were uh, inputting the mass and energy in. Their model neglects gravity, radiative cooling, and additional sources of momentum. Okay, but what, what's nice about it is you can actually calculate, if you want the code to do this, it's on GitHub, I can point you to it. You can calculate the Mach number of the winds, the outflow velocity, the density, and the pressure in the winds uh, by evolving some set of differential equations. And this is what it looks like for M82. The maximum wind velocity is 1,000 kilometers a second. A after the wind starts propagating, it just expands adiabatically, and that the decline in the pressure and the density follows uh, that adiabatic wind. Is that a reflection there? Is that a transonic this, point? Yeah, that's right. That's the sonic point. And that happens at this gain radius R the size of over which you're depositing this energy. That's an important point. So you can see that the flow becomes supersonic at that gain radius, which is actually pretty far. OK, so then you could say, well, if I just take the simulations that I just showed you, do they look like this at all? And so here, the white lines are Chevalier and Clegg, and the colored lines and the dotted lines are different ways of measuring 
the simulation, you can see it, it, it's not maybe so surprisingly just like Chevalier and Clay. The wind has decelerated a little bit because we have gravity. So that, that makes some sense. So, so first order, these hot winds look like Chevalier and Clay. Right. Yes. This is a spherical mark, right? That's right. Yeah. This is this collimated thing. What yeah, so we're measuring along the z-axis. Yeah. Why should it agree even then? Well, the opening angle is not so terrible. I, I, I don't know. You can debate about that. Uh, I mean, initially here, it's very good. And actually, what time do we measure it? We measured it then. Yeah. Yeah, so let me see. OK, and then you might say, well, that, that's just a model. Does it look like observations? Well, actually, not so unsurprisingly, but if you just model the X-ray emission from this gas and you compare it against actual X-ray observation and the two. This very simple adiabatic expansion looks a lot like, not exactly, but a lot like N82. So that's, uh, that's good. The, the differences in the, um, the, the total emission um, you know, have to do with what's going on at the center of the, the system. The density in our model is not quite the same, but we're not trying to perfectly reproduce this. This is more of a sanity check. OK, so, so that's well and good. Uh, but then you might say, well, what happens if you actually allow for the gas to cool? And there, it depends quite strongly on what the density of the gas is. And that depends on the mass loading of the gas. So what Todd Thompson did in 2006 with Elliot and David Weinberg and uh, someone else who I'm missing, uh, he just said, well, what happens if I take Chevalier and Plague and based on the density in this adiabatic wind, uh, just say, well, it's not adiabatic. It can cool and calculate a cooling time. And then think about what the structure of that wind might look like. And he says, well, there's some hot, fast wind. He put in some cool clouds that were trained to possibly destroy it. And then there's a cooling radius. There's a well-defined radius. You just say, well, you know, given the density profile uh, and the cooling time and the velocity of the wind, there should be a radius at which the gas uh, becomes cold. Uh, and then there should be a decelerated cool wind beyond that. And then there's you know, maybe some other structure. So, now I'm going to do the same calculation I just showed you before, but I'm going to allow for cooling. And this is what it looks like. So now you can see the gas cools. This is in the high mass loading state, so there's a very high mass in the wind. And then eventually we'll turn off uh, the mass loading and make it, well, we'll reduce it substantially. And then you'll see the structure of the wind changes there. And that's because the cooling time of the wind is changing because the density of the wind is going down. And you know, what's remarkable about this is if you calculate from Todd's model the cooling radius that you thought should be there, that is indeed the cooling radius that we get out of the simulation. So that seems to hold. So if you wanted to have a second order approximation for one of these winds, you might say, well, Chevalier and Clay like, but it, you allow it to cool. Uh, does that actually work out in some detail when, um, you know, again, to the degree to which the opening angle is large, um, the answer is, yeah, that seems to work. Now, as you change the mass loading, the cooling radius will vary. Yes? Uh, so I think you mentioned this. Do you, uh, do you manually change the mass loading wind? Yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh, I showed in a plot at the beginning uh, some slides ago, which I, I won't go back to, but I can show you later. We had, at the, init the initial mass loading was high, and then we turned it down. And that's what sets this transition. That's right. OK, so now I only have 15 minutes left. Oh, I just wanted to show you what the structure of the wind looks like in that case. And basically, what, he, what Todd said, what happened, more or less happens, although the, the velocity declines, it does not decline all the way. And that's because the gas has got a lot of velocity in it already. OK, so the, the, all the gas becomes cool beyond the cooling radius, but it's still moving with a relatively high velocity. Okay, and this is the high density of the high state. OK, so now we're going to move to a picture where instead of what I showed you before, we're going to allow for clustered feedback. So we're going to split up this central region. We're going to distribute it through the disk. And uh, again, apologies about the resolution, which are playing games with the, uh, the ticks here. It's just the projector. Um, the structure in the wind becomes much more complicated. So this is the high density phase, the high state right now. And you can see that a lot of the outflowing gas is cooling. OK, but then if we wait long enough, the uh, this high density phase will go down, you'll see that the wind becomes much lower density. You can see much more of the structure that's involved uh, in a bit. And that happens soon, I promise. I should have made the movie shorter, but uh, here we are. So now you can see that the, the wind is, the hot wind is beginning to dominate again, and you're left with this 
debris. And you might say, well, what is that debris? And that's really uh, the essential part, uh, in some ways, of what we've done. This debris comes from two different things. It comes from the physical effect of tearing off some of the material okay, of the disk, heating it, and then that material then cools out because locally in that region of the gas, the effective mass loading of the wind there is larger. So the local cooling time can go down. But some of the material is apparently torn off and entrained in the wind. And detangling these two uh, mechanisms is something that we're uh, still working on. Now, um, you can see that the structure, this is a slice through the model, it's much more complex. Some of the general features are there. For instance, when the wind is mass loaded, then it cools out. Uh, but when the wind is not mass loaded, then the hot wind becomes volume filling again, and then you get this low, uh, low temperature uh, material in these filaments. Uh, that are moving out. And you might wonder, well, how fast is that stuff moving? Well, there's, there's quite a wide uh, variety in the cold material. We can accelerate, you know, this material, I, I hesitate to say that it's all accelerated to this velocity, but we know that the fastest moving material is stuff that is to cool down the wind. We've been able to check that in a new simulation that I'll describe in a bit. Some of this does appear to be this material that is lofted, so it doesn't all get up to the same temperature as the wind and cool back down. Some of it takes a track through phase space where it doesn't heat all the way to the temperature of the wind. At least that's what these initial calculations show. This gives you some better idea of the difference between the high mass loading and the low mass loading state. So a lot of what you're seeing here is actually uh, stuff that's cooled out of the wind. Um, this material, a lot of it is cooled out of the wind as well, but the, the volume filling density is, is much lower in this case than in this case, and that makes sense, because the cooling time of the hot wind is, is much longer. Uh, and this is just what it looks like in the low, uh, the low mass loading phase. And so in the low mass loading phase, you can see that actually the velocities are, uh, are higher than in the uh, high mass loading phase. And that's because more of this material is cooling out of the wind, which is already moving quite fast. Less of it is forming near the disk. And you might say, well, then how is this multi-phase structure um, you know, generated? Well, we can just do the same simulation without the disk there and say, well, you know, what, what role did it play? Well, what's interesting, this clustered model, you can think about um, you know, each of these individual little bubbles as like individual Chevalier and Clegg-like models that then run into one another. Okay. So there will be a hot moving outflow, but those hot moving outflows at any space, uh, point in space, will have different velocities and different densities, and will shock against one another. And that will generate this kind of structure that you see uh, here, which is this, uh, this ring-like structure. This is you know, maybe not the same physical mechanism, but is reminiscent of what you see in Perseus as well. So that's something that we're thinking about. Okay. But you don't see the filamentary structure in this until you turn on the wind or the disk, and then, then you see this filamentary structure. So it's definitely the case that the wind disk interaction is important for sending this multi phase structure, at least in the context of these simulations. Okay, I only have about 10 minutes left. I want to describe some new simulations, so you might say, well, that's you know, well and good, but that's very prescribed. Um, you know, how are you going to improve the realism of this model? But Evan's interested in doing this through doing subgrid simulations where she's modeling the evolution of clusters of stars and their uh, supernova going off in a turbulent medium. This is work that she's doing with Eve now. And what she does is for you know, the same star formation history that we put into uh, these individual clumps, she's propagating that through a volume of turbulent gas and then looking at the mass loading and the energy loading at the edge of this volume, which is comparable to the size of these clumps. We can then use that to account for some of these subgrid um, you know, traversal through the interstellar medium and use that uh, energy input and, ma and mass loading uh, into a simulation. And that's, that's what we've done here. Uh, and this looks similar, uh, but not identical to what you saw before. And there's some more detailed structure that, uh, that we've been able to track. We're also now tracking, so, so you can see there's a lot less material that's in uh, the cooled outflow here. It's more, uh, more diffuse. Um, even in what we would call the, the high mass loading phase. Okay, and now I'll show you, um, so we're still working on the analysis of this, and then, you know, the plan is to calculate the different line profiles that you would see looking at galaxies like this, 
and understand whether there's observational signatures that can tell the difference between these. We're also going to be moving to you know, a full model with star formation feedback, but uh, that hasn't happened yet. OK, and now I'm just going to uh, show you what this galaxy looks like. Again, I'm sorry about being on UGA here. This is a rendering of, uh, of that galaxy uh, in the low mass loading phase. And so you can see you know, the background that I've been showing you all along is this, this multi-phase wind that you get out of uh, the simulation. And then we'll turn down and fall back toward the disk. Density? That's well, yes, it's a combination of things. So these are isodensity contours that you're seeing. So in the wind itself, uh, that material is integrated along the line of sight. When you hit an isodensity surface, then there's some coloration that's put into play. The disk, however, has some uh, surface shading applied to it. Okay, uh, and we separate out. It'll loop through. The, we separate out the disk and this other material based on what the velocity in the z direction is. And we use that to affect the coloration of how that is. Uh, so that just gives us one way of telling uh, material that's close to the disk but still moving uh, up uh, away from the disk itself. GPUs are good for all of this. GPUs are great for all of this. <laughs> yes, that's right. So I did this on my desktop. Um, and and so, so yeah, so how do we do this? Well. Um, so NVIDIA uh, makes the GPUs that we use, and they actually have a software suite that does the rendering for you. So I did that uh, animation just with, uh, you know, with some input from them, but, um, but on my desktop, just playing around with the camera movement and see this kind of thing. And it's very good for analyzing data very quickly because as you can see on the fly, you can change the coloration mapping uh, to your simulation. So this is a cosmological simulation with Choya. So my student, Bruno, has now included self-gravity in a particle scheme for the dark matter. Uh, and this is one of our test calculations that he's done here. And, and what you can see is uh, you know, we're just changing the color map of basically the, uh, the point at which this isodensity contour is, um, uh, is animated. Uh, and then you can, you can take the data, move around, and play with it, and then animate paths and do movies and that kind of thing. So it's really neat. What we're doing with NVIDIA now is because we have all of the data on the GPU, we're actually integrating this software with Troya. So you'll be able to do these renderings in real time while the simulation is running. So the simulations I showed you, these, uh, these movies here, the way we did these movies is I just worked out the geometry for doing the projection for each individual piece of the simulation. So this is run on um, you know, thousands of GPUs, I think 2,000 something GPUs. And so each one of them produces a little patch of the PNG that's then stitched together after the fact. We can't do the full rendering here, but because all of the information is on the GPUs with their software, we'll be able to do real-time rendering. If we saved all the data in that output, it would be like uh, many hundreds of teraflops, uh, or ter sorry, terabytes, uh, which we, we can't get all of that space on, uh, uh, on disk. So, um, so you know, we've been, uh, this will give us a way of doing some of these three dimensional things. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, so I guess that's where I'll stop since I only have a few more minutes. Um, so yeah, this is an incomplete story, I think. So I want, I want to get that across to you. Uh, you know, it complements, I think, a lot of ways the work that other people are doing in this field. Cosmological simulations are remarkably good for understanding you know, the CGM and especially higher temperature uh, lines and, and, and uh, modes of the CMB, or CMB gosh, uh, of, uh, of these absorption and emission signatures because a lot of that material is much further out away from the disk uh, and we're not capturing that at all. We're not realistically modeling the inflow of gas. But what we're trying to do is capture with as much fidelity as we can uh, the material uh, that is coming out um, in this cold phase, in this hot winds, by you know, fixing the resolution to be the same everywhere. And that's very expensive to do. We're hopeful that adds to the uh, to the conversation, but I don't think it's the end stage because I think we need to combine forces and use you know information from different scales, the individual cloud scale, the simulations of individual galaxies, cosmological scales to understand where these different models are applicable and which ones are physically realistic under what conditions. So, all right, thank you. Thanks for your time. So, 
at the, at the beginning, then you said that it's hard to accelerate the cold material by mass loading yeah. it. And then at the end, you say that when you put in the disk, you get filaments. And I said, so why? And I thought, so the, is it that but the, the disk is providing some the mass for the mass loading? So does this mean that you have slow filaments, and then there's other cold material that? It, they're, they're at a range of velocities. Uh, and so some of the material is more like that initial simulation I showed, where you hit it with a hot wind, you tear it apart, but you can't accelerate it. You know, if you think about turbulent gas, the volume filling fraction of very dense gas is extraordinarily small. So think about pushing on that hot gas with a, or that cold gas with a hot wind. It's like pushing on meters. It's very difficult. You know, and that and those those little small filaments just are very difficult. Their cross-sectional area is, is you know, the ram pressure applied to that is not a large one. So it's difficult to get that stuff accelerated. Okay, but you do see a material that forms along the way. So as you tear up some of this material and heat it, the bulk effect is that you overload or you, you mass load this wind. And then parts of that wind can then cool out again. And that can form these filaments, which then still interact if they have any relative velocity compared to the hot wind with the hot wind. So it's a, it's a very complicated structure. My sense is that Actually, because of the difference between this more recent model and the previous model in terms of what the structure of the multiphase outflow is, you might be able to connect the way in which the energy and momentum are distributed through the disk in a more realistic model for star formation and feedback. That might tell you something about which of these two effects is more important. Would it be too simplistic to say that you'd have an observational prediction where the filaments would be slow and the shell-like material would be fast? Or would that not uh, but I, but I, like I said, I think some of the filaments aren't that slow. Not quite that aren't, 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 you know, there's there's a range, I think, of velocities. Um, you know, this this work that we're doing with uh, with Tim, and we don't have the time yet, uh, would have comparable spatial resolution to the high resolution simulations that we have. So in terms of if the morphological structure of the filaments uh, in these different uh, lines tells you something important about uh, that you can connect to the velocities that you don't have. There, there will be better IFU imaging of M82 to go along with this, but it's just not done yet. Then we might be able to connect those two pieces together. Um, but I'm, I'm hopeful that just the morphological information itself provides uh, some, some information that we can use to concern. We know that the, the feedback and star information in this model is not realistic. You know? That isn't entirely the goal of these simulations, although we're going to try to push better in that direction uh, now, especially because we have particle models that we can track. So. Okay, yes. No, I mean, are you considering also to include uh, cosmic rays at a certain point? Uh, maybe if you're talking yeah. I mean, we have a setup, yes. so that would be idea. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is something that we've uh, thought a lot about. Um, so, Evan, as part of her time at Princeton, wants to put MHD in the simulations. Because we use the same integrators that like Athena uses, but we just skip the MHD step, it's actually not difficult in principle to change this to be an MHD code. Okay. But then you still have the question of cosmic ray transport. You know. And what's interesting is that GPUs are designed to do ray tracing. So in principle, you might be able to come up with something that uniquely leverages the GPUs to do the transport problem. But uh, you still have to worry about how tangled the magnetic fields are on small scales and what the effective propagation speed of the cosmic rays are, and that changes the way in which they drive the material potentially out of the galaxy. Um, and there's been great work in the FIRE collaboration. Andre Krastoff and his group have looked into this. Other people look the people at yeah, Wisconsin. Yeah, yes. yes um, so we have a student income. Yeah, I mean, there are also some kind of similarities. Yeah, you know, some yeah. approximation that could be nice to test the setup. Yeah, so if you're interested, we're, uh, I'm sure, you know, uh, I mean, the code is public, so it's not like, yeah. you know, but it doesn't have MHD yet, so we're still working on that. That's something that we can talk much more about if you want. Sure. Or, yeah. John, you lost the next step. In this Sorry. dual origin of the cold gas, do you predict them like a, a bimodal metallicity distribution of the cold gas, or are they still fundamentally coming from the same? Yeah, so, so we have done the following test, which I'm not, I haven't showed you, but will be in a future paper, where we colorize, the, we have a passive scalar that one comes from the disk and one comes from the hot outflow. And those, well, the extremes of that color um, variable. Um, 
you know, the disk has one and then hot output one zero or something. And that will give us a chance to see how much of this material actually would have a different metallicity owing to enrichment from the disk or enrichment. This is really supernova hot winds that's coming out, right? So it actually will have, a, in principle, a different uh, metallicity than, uh, uh, than the disk material. Yeah, so that's a great idea. Yes. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so yeah, we have done some resolution studies. Uh, oh, that's another, yeah, okay. So this gives you some idea of what happens when you increase the resolution. This is in the high mass loading phase, okay, and you can see that the, the gas actually, more of it gets cooled. Uh, I'm not sure that this is terribly surprising, um, and the reason is that I think more of the gas can reach higher densities with the higher resolution. So it just cools out quicker. Uh, but the kind of uh, study that you're suggesting, where then you try to use these different resolution simulations, first of all, to look to see whether there's an impact on the output masses. I think that's uh, something that, you know, in the next paper, which we're actually looking at this question, we'll have some answer for. Um, but then you might like to use these simulations as an input, perhaps, given even though there are flaws, to a cosmological simulation where you have a wind. And you can't resolve the same structures, but you might be able to say that, you know, we expect that wind of this density and temperature and outflow velocity in the cosmological simulation has this interior density structure and would lead to this, you know, absorption symmetry. Uh, and that's important because, you know, the equivalent width of these lines knows something about uh, the cloudlets inside of the, uh, of the volume. It's not, you know, it's, uh, it does, uh, it, it is sensitive to, to that in some way. So, um, so we'd like to we'd like to address that. I'll be this. Yeah. So, um, would you expect the, this cold gas that you see better with the high resolution to make stars, and then you would have stars <laughs> flying out of the galaxy? At, at no, a thousand no. Per second? But I, I don't think so because there will be. I do. I do agree with McCord that there's probably limiting scale, and once the gas gets down to the scale where uh, the sound speed times the cooling time. Uh, you know, that defines a length scale. Below that scale, it would be difficult for it to compress under its self-gravity. So you so. expect no star formation? I think not, um, not out here. I can't tell you for sure in here whether there's uh, any so stars. There are observational claims for star formation in outflows. Um, well, it may not be in the not in of these simulations. I mean, we're not including star formation. I haven't calculated the self -grav there's no self-gravity in the gas in this calculation, so it might be interesting. Okay. I mean, we, we now have self-gravity in the code, so we can try this and see. Um, that's an interesting suggestion. I will write to you when we do it, and we can talk more about it. Okay. More questions? All right. All right, thanks a lot. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>